Hi there, this is Growing Together, a gardening podcast with me, John Lamb, reporter from the Fargo Forum, and with me as always, Don Kinsler, the North Dakota State Extension Agent for Horticulture. Don, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Always great to be here. Well, it is, and we actually have some some kind of news. We uh, breaking may, news. Yeah, yeah, really for for us in this area. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about this a little bit? It is the emerald ash borer. You know, we knew we in North Dakota and Western Minnesota knew that this was going to be coming. That this boring insect that has killed millions of trees. We knew it was headed this way because we were surrounded on three sides: Winnipeg. Sock Center, Minnesota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But it had never progressed more than about 130 miles closer. But now uh, it has been found just within the past weeks in Moorhead, Minnesota. So right across the river from Fargo. Yeah. And, do you know, so like how let's talk a little bit about how, first of all, First of all, what is the emerald ash borer? Let's talk about this because we need to kind of know what we're dealing with here. Yeah, the emerald ash borer is a uh, – it's got several – life stages to this insect. Uh, The insect was native to Asia and it was brought to North America, to the United States uh, and first found in Michigan in uh, about 2002. Now, it was believed it probably came, the larvae, which is kind of the caterpillar stage of this insect, the larvae was probably uh, in embedded in a packing crate or a pallet that came across on a cargo ship. And then it was unloaded. And then, of course, that larvae uh, turned into an adult. And all of a sudden, you have the adult beetle, uh, the emerald ash borer beetle, uh, in our area. And so they can quickly, of course, multiply. And then it has spread to 34 states. So as insects go, it has spread quite rapidly in the past 20 years. And in the past 20 years, then, it has progressed from Michigan outward to 34 states. And it has killed uh, over 25 million, probably approaching 30 million ash trees in the United States. It's a real danger. It is. We haven't seen uh, an insect invasion causing this much damage to trees probably since Dutch elm disease. You know, and, uh, most of us have heard of the Dutch elm disease problem that just devastated the American elm. The, while there's not necessarily much danger to people directly with this thing, I mean, just the fact that it can kill so many trees, like what what kind of an impact would that have? Not let's just say like on the aesthetics of a yard, but like what what would that mean to a yard? I mean, it, it totally changes your your shade dynamic. It could Really, your house could get a lot hotter. You have a lot less shelter for wind, things like that. Like what? What all? What all? What all are the impacts of this? Yeah, let, let's talk about that. So, what, what this boring insect does uh, once it gets into trees, and we can talk maybe a little bit more about how it actually invades into trees. But once it gets into ash trees, uh, the adult lays eggs. The eggs go uh, hatch into a larvae. The larvae tunnels through, and so uh, it fairly quickly, within a year or so, it kills the ash tree. So if we think about our neighborhoods, our yards that are going to have these dead ash trees in, like you say, there's a couple, certainly some impacts, you know, devastating impacts. One of those is going to be, we'll have big dead ash trees in our yard. Yeah. And one of the main things is these are not typically homeowner cut down type things. It would be very hard to take a chainsaw in a residential neighborhood and cut down these big trees by yourself. Because people who don't have ash trees, these are full grown mature. Uh, these are big shade trees. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yep, they're, they're like the oaks full size. And, yep. yep, exactly. The oaks and the elms and the ash and the maples. These are the big ones. And so trying to remove a large ash tree by yourself is going to be really difficult. And for anyone who has had a large shade tree removed from a backyard, it can be very expensive. So the cost to homeowners is going to be great. And so, yeah, other than trying to get rid of this big dead tree in your backyard, the other thing is going to be shaded yards uh, will be sunny. Uh, And so we could lose that cooling on many of our homes. So the heating or the cooling costs in the summertime are going to be greater And so all of a sudden, uh, some of us that have developed shade-type gardens, shade-type plantings, they might not do so well anymore when we've lost the shade. Uh, And when we think about the number of ash trees in communities, in North Dakota, it varies from about 25 to 80 percent 
of the trees planted in our communities are ash trees. And they're in shelter belts, they're in farmstead yards. So picture some communities where up to 80% of the trees are all of a sudden standing dead. And of course, they aren't going to just disappear, vaporize. They're going to be standing there dead waiting for us to remove them. Yeah. And while in a place like in a a remote area or a non-living area, like in a shelter belt, if you have a dead tree, you know, it's there, you don't need to take it down right away. But if you have a dead tree close to your house or close to power lines or something like that, there's a real danger there that, you know, if if the tree is is dying, decaying, you know, and something, wind comes along and, and it tips over, it could still damage, it could still do damage to a property. Well, that's a good point because the, that dead tree isn't going to just sit there forever, it's yeah. going to start to decay and become brittle. And then at that point, there's going to be limbs falling off that could land on roofs, yep. power lines, like you mentioned, Cars, uh, yeah. uh, dangerous to people, dangerous to neighbors that are close by that tree. And so when I mentioned that uh, a large percentage of trees in communities are ash, now some cities, such as Fargo, have worked on reducing the quantity of ash trees. Now in Fargo, there's approximately 24% of the trees that are ash, but that's an average. There are certain uh, neighborhoods within Fargo or other communities that are maybe 50% or more. So it's going to affect neighborhoods differently. I would imagine a lot of those neighborhoods would be older neighborhoods, you know, maybe uh 75, 100-year-old homes, you think? or They or are. Some uh, and too? really, some of the, uh, the neighborhoods that were developed even within the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, ash was the number one tree planted in many of our neighborhoods. Oh, really? It was that recent? Exactly. Yep, because um, we really didn't hear much about the emerald ash borer until, well, I suppose I became most aware of it maybe five years ago. Uh, but in the meantime, there were a lot, a lot of ash planted because ash was the number one replacement for Dutch elm disease. So it was the number one because ash are native to North Dakota. It does well throughout the state. It's a fast growing tree relatively, but relatively long lived also. And there were many new varieties developed with certain shapes and, and sizes. And it was one of the number one uh, trees sold in nurseries. So it was heavily planted up until really relatively few years ago. Yeah, and the, the benefits of an ash tree are is that, you know, again, you have this big tree. It can give a lot of shade. You know, it, it it's, can be an attractive thing. One of the things I read is that it's actually, uh, it's it like you said, it's not only native to our area, but it actually do, can do well in urban areas, right? It can do well in compacted soil. It does, you know, and in next to a parking lot where yeah. the majority of its roots are covered with blacktop, it does very, very well. It makes a nice boulevard tree. It's fairly neat, especially the newer hybrids. NDSU re released quite a number of new hybrids over the last probably couple of decades uh, with really neat shapes, growing habits. Some were kind of an upright, kind of a columnar or oval. Others were neat rounded. So there had been a lot of research done on these. The unfortunate thing, though, is none of them are resistant to the emerald ash borer. Will it only go after ash trees or does it go into other trees? Only ash trees. So okay. if there is any benefit, but of course, unfortunately, there are so many ash trees, but um, it does not affect other types of trees. It's very so it's selective. it's specific only to ash. Uh, now, there are some types of trees that have common names kind of closely related. The main one is one called mountain ash, but that's not a true ash. Oh, so really okay. it does. And if a person is wondering, well, let's see, I don't really know the difference between some of the trees. How do you tell if you do have an ash tree? Uh, one of the easiest ways is to just do an online search. How do I identify an ash tree? And that will show uh, the leaf pattern. Uh, the bark on an older tree tends to have uh, what's described as diamond-shaped ridges. You know, some trees have more of a smooth bark. Uh, uh, the ash trees have a, quite a, a ridged, ridge type in the, kind of the shape of a diamond. Uh, so that's one way. The leaves are kind of a compound leaf uh, made up of leaflets. But again, the easiest way is just to search for a, a photo of an, of an ash leaf. Do you know if there's a registry for the people can look online and find out like what their boulevard tree is? 
I believe there is. For the boulevard in Fargo and many other communities, too, there they do keep track of what is planted. And that would be through the city? Through the city. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, the city forestry departments. Do you know if this if forestry, are they going around and examining uh, the ash trees? Or how are they, or is it a matter where they rely on the community and the homeowners to to try to go out and identify if their ash tree is having problems? Well, yeah, you bring up a great point. How do you know if your ash tree has been infected? So if we have the emerald ash borer right on our doorstep, and even though it hasn't been detected in North Dakota, many of us suspect that it is here and just hasn't been found yet. Uh, at some point, we're going to discover it. But how do you know if your ash tree has been infected? Uh, because not everything that causes dead wood in an ash tree is going to be the emerald ash borer. Okay, but there are a couple of ways to, to look at this. Oh, well, first of all, I should mention, if you suspect in North Dakota that your ash tree might have it, if it's having problems, if you're seeing dead wood in it, the entity that is uh, centrally collecting all this information and will investigate is the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. So you can do an online search, North Dakota Department of Agriculture Emerald Ash Borer. And that will take you to the link, the site, where you can report if you suspect anything. So they're the central clearing bureau for this information. because they want to know if you're suspecting something doesn't look right. They want to know so that they can identify if this is moving. So how do you know for sure if it is? Well, there's a couple of indications. One is unusual woodpecker activity in a tree. Now, that may sound kind of weird, but... These uh, emerald ash borers, uh, the caterpillar stage gets into the tree and they're working internally in that tree. And woodpeckers can he hear, I suppose, that that uh, larvae, that caterpillar is in the tree. And so they're looking for food. So they'll start pecking at the tree until they find it. So, I mean, not every ash tree that, um, that has a woodpecker is going to have emerald ash borer. But that is one link that they've noticed that unusually high amount of emerald of, um, of woodpecker activity could, could be the borer. So the first step, of course, is to make sure that your tree is an ash tree. And then if you see unusual woodpecker activity on that ash tree, or if you're seeing dead branches, then you may want to contact the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. There are a couple of other things that you can notice. And let, let's talk about the insect itself. Um, you rarely see the adult beetle uh, because they're kind of tricky and they're probably going to be up in the tree somewhere. And so you may not notice them. But what the adult emerald ash borer beetle looks like is they're a metallic green on this beetle. And the beetle, the size of the beetle, uh, can fit on a penny. So oftentimes you see them photographed on a penny to give the relationship of the size. And so they're a, a, kind of a neat, I suppose that's where the emerald description they, comes they, from. They, they are so destructive, but they are, they are beautiful. They're pretty, that yeah. metallic green yeah. on the wings. And again, they're kind of a longer than wide beetle yeah. you know, fitting on a penny. And that um, adult which you rarely probably would see, but that adult lays eggs in the crevices of the bark. And so you rarely see the eggs. Uh, the eggs hatch into a larvae that tunnels into the tree. And of course, you don't see that because it's going on inside the tree. Uh, if you were to peel away the bark, which doesn't happen really until the tree dies, right. if you peel away the bark right under the bark, you see a winding serpentine S-shaped channels as that uh, bore is tunneling through. And now that's what causes the damage yeah. because it's interrupting the flow of water and nutrients up inside the tree. So the tree basically just kind of starves to death eventually. When that larvae inside turns back into the adult stage inside the tree, it exits the next year out of a little hole, it uh, turns into an adult beetle that chews its way back out of the tree, and it makes a little D-shaped, you know, the, uh, the shape of a capital D, yeah. a little D-shaped exit hole. So occasionally in a tree, if you look 
carefully somewhere on the trunk, you might see these little D-shaped exit holes. So if you suspect a tree, you might look um, at a tree to see if you can ever see those little exit holes as well. Otherwise, the the thing that is so destructive uh, with these trees is it takes a while before you would notice anything wrong. Because that borer works internally in the tree for probably one to two years before the tree actually starts to die. Uh, And at that point, when about maybe 25% of the tree is dead uh, due to the borer activity internally, that tree is probably too far gone to do anything. Are there treatments? Because I understand that there are some chemical treatments, but they're not cheap. They are. There there are treatments, and the best treatments are called systemic insecticides. Those are the insecticides that are applied to a tree, uh, primarily the root system, that will be taken up by the root system and go internally throughout the tree, and then that will make the the sap of the tree toxic to these insects. So when those borers start working their way inside on the wood, uh, then the borer will die. Uh, So the most commonly available product to homeowners that would like to treat their own tree is one called Bio-Advanced Tree and Shrub Insecticide. Bio-Advanced Tree and Shrub Insecticide. Now, you find that at garden centers, uh, national chain stores that have a garden center. It's in a blue jug. You'll recognize it if you go to the shelf. It's uh, in a blue jug with kind of red and white label, bio-advanced tree and shrub insecticide. And the directions will tell how to apply. Basically, you mix it up in a bucket of water following the label directions and then apply kind of in the area around the base of the trunk. But again, the directions will tell you exactly how because the, the way that you apply it is going to be important. So now it takes a while for that product to move up within a tree. Does it, does it go up through the roots? It goes up through the okay. roots, exactly. Now, a a problem with that is that if we wait to see much dead up in our tree, the tree may be too far gone for this product to actually help. So now a a question, and there's not a good answer for this. Okay, if you've got an ash tree in your backyard, if it looks healthy, should you start applying this? A a disadvantage of the product uh, is that it will have to be reapplied every one to two years. So, um, you know, do we need to apply that every year for the rest of the tree's life? Maybe. The, uh, the other thing, too, there are insecticides that can be injected by professional tree people, arborists. And they're a heavier-duty chemical that probably lasts longer. And so for a high-value ash tree in one's yard, you might contact a tree service, an arborist, to see about injecting that tree. And you may get uh, an additional time on that. But the key point being that these products will have to be applied every so often, really for the life of the tree. And would that be something that you do as as a precaution? I mean, or would you only do it once you see the signs? Because once you see the signs, again, it almost sounds like it's too late. Exactly. Uh, So do you do that as a precaution? Some of the recommendations are to wait until you know that that borer has been detected in your area, uh, such as within about 15 miles, uh, and then begin treating. If you begin treating too early, maybe you're applying it just fruitlessly. Maybe that borer insect isn't even in your area. But it's a difficult situation because how do we know it's not in your area? How do you know it's not working in your area, even though we aren't seeing a lot of dead? How do we know? So there's It's a very difficult situation to know, should you begin applying a preventative insecticide or or not? Do you weigh it? And that's a really difficult thing to to answer. I suppose each of us will have to make that decision on our own. But do you see what I mean where it could be lurking in a neighborhood and you don't know it? Well, I think another question people will have is that, you know, once anytime you're dealing with insecticides, you're dealing with questions of public health and health to people and animals. Do you know anything about these? You know, because if we're talking about, a, you know, something in our yard and, and putting a lot of chemicals in the, in the, in the 
you know, the ground or the roots of the tree, you know, are they safe if for our dogs or are they safe for other animals? Do you know anything about yeah, that? Yeah, the, the nice thing about the systemic insecticides is that they're enclosed within the tree. Okay. And so they're taken up and enclosed within the tree. And the the active ingredient most common in these is, uh, it's a mouthful called imac, imac, yeah, see what I mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Imadicloprid. I think I'm getting that close. <laughs> Imadicloprid. And, uh, but anyway, that's just down in the fine print on the label. Uh, boy, I massacred that one. <laughs> but anyway, um, that where they're taken up within a tree, it, it stays within the tree. So unless something is eating on that tree. Now, one good point about ash trees is they do not produce a flower that's visited by insects or uh, that's visited by good insects. You know, there's always a risk of putting systemics on a tree if beneficial insects, such as honeybees, would visit that tree. Then it, they can be killed as well. For example, lindens, which have a very beautiful flower, and you know, you can get linden honey. Because oh. the bees, uh, the bees visit those, and so. Um, but with ash trees, they they are not visited by honeybees, and so there are not typically beneficial insects that are going to be damaged by this systemic. You know, we talked a little bit about the damage that the damage to a community and to an area that can be done. Um, any idea? Like you, you talked about the the Dutch elm disease previously was was a big a big threat and did a lot of damage. Do you know how how much of an impact Dutch elm had in this area? In this area, I I'm not sure the exact figures of what it uh, what it did, uh, but what it the results were that anyone that needed to that wanted to preserve these beautiful trees, elm trees arching over our beautiful streets, needs to inject them. And so, for example, on some of our university campuses, they inject the trees with a preventative material uh, yearly or every other year. And so it really changed the neighborhoods. Uh, I, I don't recall what percentage, but it wiped out elms to a point where uh, the ash were needed as a replacement. Now, there are newer elm varieties that have proven resistance, you know, so maybe in the future there will be ash trees again that will show resistance. But anyway, we those just aren't here yet. The the means in which it's carried, uh, it seems like one of the one of the ways to prevent it too uh, is to um, only with firewood, not to transport firewood beyond where you get it. Really, I mean, keep it very close to its source and burn it close to its source. Right. Exactly, because it's felt that the insect itself probably isn't going to travel more than about 15 miles on its own. So it means that uh, most of the spread, once it was brought into this country, again, probably in a wood pallet or so, um, most of the transmission of the insect has been by humans uh, carrying firewood or other wood products from location to location. So where emerald ash borer is detected, quarantines are set up. And it's illegal to move firewood out of a quarantined area and into another. For example, North Dakota has a $5,000 fine if you are caught moving firewood from a quarantined area out. Uh, because those borers uh, can be in that firewood, you know, the larvae stage, the caterpillar stage of that borer uh, can be in that wood, and then you transport that somewhere else, and then that borer will hatch out into the adult stage. And each adult can lay 60 to 90 eggs. So one, one uh, adult beetle can start quite an infection itself. Going back to, I remember in the seventies, growing up, box elder bugs were a big threat and a big th uh, another. That was another, maybe you shouldn't say recent. That was almost fifty years ago. But uh, how did how did that end? How did that? Uh, what what's changed with box elder bugs and box elder trees? We don't really see a lot of box elder trees, do no, we? No, we we don't. You know that that's interesting. The box elder tree, which is native to North Dakota and Minnesota, the box elder tree kind of evolved with the box elder bugs. They're in kind of a neat relationship. The box elder bug needs the box elder tree 
in order to survive. And so when when things when living things evolve together, sometimes they have a mutually good relationship. The box elder bug doesn't actually kill the tree. Uh, they coexist, which oftentimes happens when insects and a tree species evolve together. And that's what has made the emerald ash borer so devastating in North America is because that emerald ash borer was not native. It came from another continent, Asia. In Asia, the emerald ash borer is not a pest. It's not a devastating pest because their ash trees evolved with that insect. But when the emerald ash borer then comes to North America, our ash trees had no resistance. So the emerald ash borer just had free wheeling coming right on in to, uh, to attack our ash. And there was no defense, no natural defense. Is there a potential for the tree to develop an immunity and to for for it to be, to be able to survive, or are we looking at the distinction or dis- destruction and, and extinction of a whole of a whole type of tree? Well, that's a bright spot down the road because tree species can develop resistance. That's what happened with Dutch elm disease. That's why there are resistant new elm varieties. For example, just south of Fargo, along the Wild Rice River, there were it was a whole grove of elm trees totally killed by Dutch elm disease. But there was one that survived. Really? Uh, one that survived. It's called Prairie, it's been named and released into the nursery trade called Prairie Expedition Elm. NDSU released it. And they actually took that tree and injected it with Dutch elm disease. Uh, you see, the, the beetle in that case carries a bacteria or a, f- a fun- fungus, I guess it is, that infects that tree. So they actually injected it with that fungus and, on purpose to make sure it was resistant. And yes, it didn't get the disease. So they were able to release that variety. So a similar thing maybe will happen with the ash trees. So what typically happens is in a great big area, maybe a forest, where the emerald ash borer has killed trees, if they can find a tree that has escaped, that for some reason that uh, emerald ash borer just didn't like that tree. Maybe there's something genetic. You know, maybe that tree just didn't taste good. And maybe they can isolate the characteristics of that tree and create a whole new line. So that's what they're looking at very carefully. Are there any escapes, any trees uh, that they can then propagate and keep that? So down the line, I would suspect that they'll find some resistance to it. Uh, And also... Looking at Asia, because their ash trees evolved with the emerald bark beetle and haven't been affected, can we get some? Uh, can we get some assistance from Asiatic uh, ash trees and get some of those characteristics bred into our ash trees? So there's hope down the line. In the meantime, of course, we'll uh, need to be replacing with some other good trees. Do you know in communities like Sauk Center and I think the Twin Cities, places that have experienced emerald ash borer, and really now a couple of years, three, was it 2019, I think is when Sauk Center discovered Yes, I it? believe you're right. 20, 2019, 2018. So three or four years ago now, what have they learned and, and, and how fast did it move through those areas? Do you have any idea? It usually takes from the time the, the emerald ash borer is discovered in an area, probably two to three years before you start seeing it ballooning in that area, ballooning as in trees affected. It becomes really visible. It uh, yeah, yeah, at that point. The other thing that we've learned from some of these other communities is you can certainly treat with insecticides, but in those communities... Affected trees uh, have been about ninety nine percent killed. Okay, the prevention has not been has not worked very well. Okay, so it's not like uh, there's been wholesale uh, saving of these trees. Uh, of anything that's been attacked, ninety nine percent have still died. Do you? I mean, I suppose that one way of of kind of trying to address it or or beat it in a way is to just go ahead and remove the elm and and 
try to plant something else there that may do yeah, well. Yeah, removing, pr- removing the ash. Has, ha- ash, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, many cities have been proactive in this. They know it's coming. And so uh, many ash trees that, that look like maybe they aren't quite as nice or – you know, some varieties of ash don't grow quite as nice as the new as the newer types that were developed. You know, some are kind of crooked and maybe leaning over power lines. So they've selected some ash trees just for removal proactively, and uh, and that's how they've been able to reduce the number of trees. They've gotten rid of some, and also then of course they've been replacing them with others. So one of the recommendations is if an ash tree doesn't look really really well. Well, maybe it's time to get rid of those ash trees and start your way onto something new because it takes a while to develop a new yeah. tree. So maybe in some cases, it's just as well to remove that and get a new one replacing. Picking out a tree can be daunting because you want something that's going to be there longer than you are. Um, and I know every place is different, but can you give us some examples of trees that maybe do become established and grow you know, like, like the ash was, it was a fast-growing tree. A fast-growing tree, good shade-type tree. Yeah. Well, the, luckily, there are some good replacements. Uh, one of those is hackberry. Oh, okay. That's a good shade-type tree native to the area. Uh, another great one is Ohio buckeye. Okay. And we can't let the Ohio part. You might think, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound very winter hardy. But Ohio buckeye, uh, there have been some developed in... Uh, University of Minnesota, NDSU has a couple of really good Ohio Buckeye uh, varieties. And so when we look at our local garden centers, you'll see the Hackberry, Ohio Buckeye. For kind of a smaller scale tree, not quite as huge, but Japanese tree lilac is very beautiful and has white flowers. Uh, And their oaks, uh, several different varieties of oaks that do very well. Of course, oaks are a little slower growing, but yet if you care for them, they don't have to be slow, slow, and you know they're going to last for hundreds of years. Uh, we have to be selective in the types of maples because some parts of North Dakota, just maples are not that well adapted. And so we have to be careful with the maples. But v- by visiting local garden centers especially, there are a number of uh, replacements. I know I live in Moorhead and we had – uh, shortly after we moved into the house, we had the, the one and one of the elm trees was move, removed a year before we moved in. And then the other one was was removed a couple months after we moved in uh, just because of old age and they were dying. They were just not in good shape. And um, so we had a maple put in because we have a number of maples on the boulevard. And yeah, how is it uh, doing? Well, that one didn't do very well. And uh, so we had to have it replaced and we went with a linden. Uh, we thought that that would be. Uh, oh, lindens. Yeah, I I don't think that popped into my head. Lindens, there's uh, many nice cultivars of lindens. And yeah, some good choices. They're different shapes. And they're relatively fast growing. Yeah, they are. Linden is a great uh, replacement choice. So if people discover that they have a diseased emerald ash borer or diseased ash tree with emerald ash borer, um, and they, they opt to have it removed, or if it's taken out, what what happens? I, think, I suppose if it's on the boulevard, the city comes in, they cut it down. The 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 bug is still in the tree, though, right? How how do how do they get rid of the bug if it's if once they cut the tree exactly. down? Exactly, that insect, the caterpillar stage, the boring type stage, can still be in that wood, and so that's the big danger because if that wood then is trans port it elsewhere, then you're spreading it. So uh, on boulevards, yes, these the cities are going to take care of it and they'll remove it. Now, an interesting question is, of course, okay, what's the city going to do with it? Well, typically they chip a lot of the material when they cut down trees. But there are uh, guidelines as to how fine those chippings have to be. And of course, the city is going to know that. So it has to be ground up uh, to a certain fine stage uh, that will also kill those borers. So what does what do homeowners do though if you've got a dead ash tree with all this uh, wood? Yeah. A uh, common question is: Is it going to be safe to burn that firewood? Yeah. And the question and yes, the answer is yes. It's safe to burn that, but it should not be transported. You shouldn't take the firewood anywhere else. So uh, burn it right there on the premises. Just so, has to stay on the property. Exactly. Uh-huh. So uh, lots of bonfires, I suppose. Yeah, because I, yeah, I mean these are big trees too. Exactly. Because again, transporting it to a, a neighbor or somebody else in another town could be a major cause of spread. I wonder if it's, you know, if he 
But if you, you know, if you cut down a tree and then you have even these big sections that you intend to burn, if the bug is still in there, the bug can still get out and move on though, really. It can, yeah, because the caterpillar stage that's internal will turn into an adult that uh, will get out and move to other places and so they really lay for, more eggs. For safety's reasons, the best thing probably would be to grind it up. Yeah, to, exactly. to have it, have it yeah, to fine enough. Or, specifications. you know, again, burning is a good way to get rid of it too, but... Uh, You'd really have to... That's, that's have a lot of That's a lot, lot of bonfires. Lot, yeah, that's a big bonfire. <laughs> then you'd really have to want There to, may be... A, you'd want to have it soon. You know, you, 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 oh, wouldn't, yeah, exactly. you wouldn't want it sitting in your yard for months. Exactly. And, um, you know, there may be a resurgence in wood stoves. Yeah. You know, it, it's devastating and a person does want to downplay it. But, you know, nature has these types of cycles. You know, we saw it with the Dutch elm disease. We recovered, you know, and I'm sure we're, we're going we're gonna to work our way out of this too. Luckily, it doesn't go to all other tree species. So, you know, there's hope. You know, it sounds, sounds maybe a little dismal, but uh, there's always hope. Let's start some new trees. That sounds good. You know, Don, another thing that, that people have read in the news or have heard about recently is the Northern Plains Botanic Garden Society. They This has been in the works for some time, but they are moving forward with their Japanese garden. Um, this is the place that's up by, people may remember, Yonker Farm, uh, and it's up by there. And uh, there's, the, there's the animal shelter, Homeward Bound is right there. There's a community gardens just a little bit north and a dog park. It's up, up by the by the air base in North Fargo. Go, but what what is what is the Japanese garden? What, what are the plans for this? Well, it's a wonderful organization. And I was at their annual meeting the other night of the Northern Plains Botanic Garden Society. It's their twenty fifth anniversary. They've been working on this for 25 years, and it's fun to see things progressing. Now, there are some things that are already progressing at that site up, like you say, by the old Yunker Farm, and a couple of things that are currently existing. And many people that have gone to see this said that it's it's a hidden gem. Why don't more people know about this? Well, up there at that site, there's already lots to see. There are gardens that are already planted, very beautiful in the summertime with annual flowers, perennial flowers. And also, there's an edible forest up oh. there. Yeah, and it's a kind of a display type planting of fruit trees, apple trees, plum trees, cherry trees. Uh, there are nut trees growing there, and it's all fenced in so the deer don't get it. Okay. But it's kind of like a a walk-through teaching, learning example of fruit that we can grow in our area. So and will it be like ultimately kind of like a very small orchard? It, yes. Yeah, okay. a small orchard. Um, there are plantings of things like strawberries, raspberries there also. And from time to time, there are tours through that area and workshops in there to kind of help educate us as to what we can grow and how to grow it in the way of fruit trees and nut trees. Do you know how far along these fruit trees are? Like how old? Uh, yeah, I believe that was probably started maybe five years ago, approximately. Okay. And so when will they start bearing fruit? Or and already? some of them are already bearing oh, okay. it, uh, all, already. And so again, keep your eye out for that. Uh, anytime you see at the edible forest up at the Northern Plains Botanic Garden Society, uh, an event going on up there. So anyway, there was, there's already things happening. But one of the new, newer exciting things is the Japanese garden that will be part of that. And there are already some entities of that that have been in place. So when you go up there, you'll see kind of a, an opening arch, a very Japanese style. And kind some of a gate. Bridge work, kind of yeah, a gate. Yeah. And uh, there, there are already some elements, kind of a bridge and walkway. So you can tell that this is going to be Japanese garden. And at the meeting the other night, the gentleman that designed and is working with the design of this is also the one from the Portland Japanese garden. He's okay. been the head man there for 20 some years. And so he's uh, from Japan originally. And so the design of this is being done by someone with vast experience in designing Japanese gardens. And there's a lot of thought that goes into a Japanese garden. And so this is going to be fun to see in our area uh, because, uh, as he indicated the other night, there are Japanese gardens in Japan that are like 800 years old. And 
so the, it, it's neat the way they incorporate certain elements into this to make it. And he uses the word restorative. A Japanese garden is restorative, meaning, you know, sometimes we he, hear, you know, the healing power of a garden. You know, you go out into a, a beautifully uh, landscaped or a beautiful kind of a nature garden and uh, you you it just helps you. It helps your... Helps your mood, helps you yeah. everything else. And uh, the Japanese call it restorative, you know, rather than kind of a healing. Yeah, they say it's restorative. And who among us doesn't need some restorative uh, powering in, yeah. in us, you know? And so it's being developed very much in the true Japanese style. So this is going to be fun to see it develop. So what, yeah, so, I mean, we've talked in the past um, – that garden for different people means different things. Some people think of a garden, they think of a vegetable garden. I think of gardens and I think of flower gardens. In the sense of a Japanese garden, are, what what is it? Because I think we also think of Japanese gardens, sometimes we think of the rock gardens. Uh, what, what will we see up there? Yeah, I, I love that discussion because the term garden has evolved. Yeah, when I was a kid uh, – if you heard your parents talk about garden, let's go out to the garden. It was the vegetables. Yeah. And so many people grew up with the garden was the vegetable garden. But that term has broadened. In fact, the term horticulture kind of sounds academic-like. Yeah. So the current best term actually for horticulture is gardening. And so it no longer encompasses just vegetables, uh, but it's it's flower gardening, it's landscaping, uh, it's being in the outdoors, enjoying you know house plants. The whole aspect is gardening, and so a Japanese garden. Uh, what makes it so specific are the kind of the key elements that they use to represent. For example, some of a Japanese garden is like dry rock beds, and sand or gravel that is raked in certain patterns to imitate the ocean. And so it's very representative and kind of neat. You know, it helps kind of helps a person to think about some of these things, but it isn't just all rocks and kind of dry stream beds also. They're very beautiful, such as Japanese maples, um, bonsai, you know, trees pruned into very neat, almost ancient type shapes. And so many of these things represent, uh, and a great deal of thought is put into what some of these things represent. And just then when you're in the presence of a Japanese garden, it's it's a very, oh, what's the word for it? Just peaceful? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, you know, like you said, restorative. I think a lot of times in American culture now, currently, we, we probably think reset. But I think restorative has a much more of a, a much more of an, a longer lasting effect, I think, as far as a term. And so it was fascinating at the meeting the other night to see the, the gentleman from Japan and who has worked so, so greatly with these Japanese gardens. It was fascinating to see the slides that he had, the photographs that he had of these Japanese gardens, both in Portland and in Japan itself. And the beauty that goes into those. And again, you know, gardening teaches us patience. As I mentioned, some of the most famous Japanese gardens are many, many centuries old. So it takes time. But that's part of the whole thing is that it, it's not about instant gratification. It's about the process as well. And that teaches us patience. And that's part of the restorative. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a wonderful thing in this whole realm of gardening uh, if something is fast and quick, like a fast growing tree, they're also short lived. Yeah. You know, think of poplars and some of those. Um, so there's advantages to patience. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You have something, you invest in something, and it's going to be a bit more. I don't want to say solid, but it's something yeah. that's going to going well, to last a little longer. Great thing, great in. things come to those who wait. Yes, yes. Uh, do you know like what kind of plants? Because you know, you're talking about this. This person has worked in in um, is obviously knowledgeable of what what a Japan Japanese garden in Japan would look like, and in Portland, those are probably different climates from us here. What do you know any kind of like plants or trees that they're looking to do here? Right. So the the plant material is of course carefully chosen yep. to uh, adhere to our growing conditions. 
Uh, but now there are some, for example, NDSU is working on some Japanese maples oh, really? uh, that are going to be more winter hardy, some Japanese Korean type maples. So I'm sure those will be incorporated in. Those are very colorful. And sometimes they are beautiful fall yeah. color and just a neat to kind of a smaller scale, graceful type tree. Yeah, they don't they don't get as big. They, they, they really are kind of more of a garden tree, right? They are. Yeah. And many of the shrubs that we think of as common landscape shrubs, as long as they're situated properly in the right organization, the right pattern, will fit in beautifully. That'll be fun to see. It is. This is going to be a fun project to see. So uh, you know, we'll really stay tuned over the next number of years. Yeah, but there's still currently, right now, things to see. Yeah, like you said, this has been 25 years in the making, so we, we it's not like we should expect to go out there this summer and see a drastic difference from last year. But but it sounds like they're they're moving forward, and and things will start. The changes will start happening. And yes, will, and it'll, it'll be fun different. to see the process. You know, so much of gardening is the process, watching it develop. So it'll be fun to see over the course of the next few years to see this develop, even the building of it. You know, we don't need to pop in, you know, five years down the road and see. But it'll be fun to see as structures and uh, the the design and the the first elements of this being installed is going to be fun to see as well. And that just that area, again, it's just such a really nice kind of a hidden gem that I think while it's on a major street, it's on university, um, uh, the North University where it's two, two-way, there's so many things up there because like you were talking about, there's so here's this Japanese garden that's, that's evolving. Then you have these this uh, kind of fruit forest. You know, and then I think up there too. Well, they have the Northern Plains. They have their own garden area, their own lot, which is really lovely. And then I think also there's there's like a as an alphabet garden for the kids or an alphabet uh, something like that, right? Yes, there is, and of course all of those the alphabet garden, which, which is kind of neat. Yeah, uh, it's got each of the of course the ABCs mm-hmm. with plants that start with that letter. Yeah, and so from A to Z, uh, you know, I'm not sure what is A, but Z is probably zinnia. Yep. And so it's fun, fun for kids. Allium could be an A. Yes. Yeah, good one. And um, so with each of those entities is under the umbrella of the Northern Plains Botanic Garden Society. The Alphabet Garden, the Edible Forest, the Japanese Garden. And so, yeah, this summer, do take a drive up there. It's wonderful. And for all you you gardeners out there too, uh, keep your eye on them. They always, well, not always, they have had in the past, they'll have a spring sale, plant sale. And then I think they also have one maybe again in the summer. I know they've had a couple over the yeah, last couple years. they do with years. fundraisers. Yeah. And they've got a really now. good uh, website. So if you just look up Northern Plains Botanic Garden Society uh, online, and you'll find their website. And that'll give you a really good uh, idea of what's going on up there. And of course, they they do fundraising, and a person can become a member of that society. So great group of, of people, great group of volunteers. And uh, let's do a remote up there this summer. I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun? We can kind of paint mental pictures of what we're seeing there. I think it'd be fun to do this remotely from up there. That would be, well, you know, boy, that would be a a great day in the office, wouldn't it? That would. (laughs) Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Growing Together, a gardening podcast. I'm John Lamb. Don Kinsler. And Don, uh, do you have anything coming up? Do you have any any events coming up? I have another garden webinar on Wednesday night, March 15th. And Uh, during that webinar, we're going to talk about waking up your yard and garden for spring. Oh, this is... that is, alone is going to be enticing. That that sounds like there will be people who are just, they've been waiting for this for a yeah, long we'll time. We'll talk about when to fertilize lawns, uh, when to do pruning, when to uh, cut back your perennial flowers, uh, when to get your geraniums ready to go outside. Uh, so there will be a little something for everybody, including getting the vegetable garden ready to go as well. Excellent. And if people have questions, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Best way is to email me. And if you have any, like, plant questions, if you have a photo, that's always great. And best way is to email me at donald.kinsler at ndsu.edu. Well, thanks again, and looking forward to talking next time on Growing Together. Always great to be here. Thank you. Now through March 17th, get six months of unlimited access to inforum.com for just $2. 
This is a limited time offer, so don't wait. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe to take advantage.